Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Elevate Cleveland podcast. I'm your host, Chris Doyle. Here today we have Marissa Sergi and Evan Schumann. Guys, thanks for coming on. Of course, thanks for having us. So you guys are in the in the wine industry, so very different than previous guests that we've had on. We like to keep the, everything business centric. So a little bit what we were talking about before the podcast was, I want to hear a lot about the story and everything, right? So I 100% know the story started with you, Marissa, right? And then in 2020, you took over as president, Evan. So let's just start with there. Let's just start, you know, how did you, how did you start Louvabella? Where, you know, where was the inspiration and where are you guys at today with it? Yeah, so for me, I grew up around food and wine my entire life. My grandparents immigrated here from Italy and brought over that tradition. And I realized when I was a senior in high school, I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Yeah. And I found out that the university offered a winemaking degree. So I was really grateful to be able to have that privilege to refine my passion into something more uh, focused for a career and established. So um, at Cornell University, I studied winemaking, which is viticulture and enology for four years. And mm-hmm. there I created a wine label as my capstone project to graduate. And that catapulted me into the industry by really understanding what it took to create a label and pitch it for retail. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of help. I wrote a business plan and got a lot of um, awards for it. And my family originally started Louva Bell in the early 2000s, but I decided to separate separately establish my label from Luva Bella to try to do it on my own, invest my dollars, my time, and just have a manufacturing contract with Luva Bella. And I realized it was really hard to just sell one item <laughs> yeah. to a store because even if they bought, it's just not profitable. It was really hard just to sell one thing. Yeah. It's better to have a trip and maybe have a few things to sell rather than one. So mm-hmm. Fast forward to 2018, I pitched my parents to hire me to build the distribution network of the business. Mm -hmm. They were only selling the wines in Northeast Ohio at the time, and I wanted to further develop the retail distribution portion of the business. So Mm -hmm. after two years, I I, I met Evan throughout that process, and we were like, this is doing really well. All the brands were selling fairly well in all the retail stores we had it in so we're like let's see if my family would sell the business to us so we can completely change the business model to be Mm -hmm. a cpg wine company rather than a regional winery and that's how um evan came into play to to be involved in business yep and that was in 2020 right or in 2020 we officially acquired the business yeah, and then I know you, you like your background heavily in because you graduated with fine a finance degree, Penn State uh, entrepreneurship, finance. entrepreneurship. Yeah, so I mean, kind of like a bullshit like <laughs> degree. I mean, what really? How do you study entrepreneurship, right? But, oh yeah, easier uh, said than done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess through practice uh, more than study. But um, yeah, I went in. Uh, I wasn't really thrilled to go to school, but um, I picked up the uh, the the major and. Um, uh, my family owns a metal refinery in Cleveland, and uh, a lot of um, a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in my family. So I knew I wanted to start a business. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I went to school at Kent State. Never really went to class. Uh, barely graduated. But um, you did, so yeah, that's all that counts. <laughs> but I did, yeah. Uh, and I, I worked for a chemical company uh, during college, basically full time. I was there more than I really went to school. So uh, when I graduated, I started a company uh, called Zytec. Uh, raised some capital for it. It never ended up taking off. It was uh, it was converting um, byproducts from the metal industry into uh, sustainable nutrients for animal feed and fertilizer. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> And uh, raised some money and had some partnerships to produce, and then it just ended up not not taking off. But uh, out of it, I, I met a lot of great people, and um, uh, I got into some private private equity stuff. And uh, I started a consulting company working with international uh, mm-hmm. early stage companies like Series A or or seed funded companies out of primarily Israel. Um, and, uh, I had started a company through some work I did with the Youngstown business incubator, which is what brought me out to Youngstown. Um, and from there we realized, uh, that I could do 
this for a lot of companies. And so we built that, uh, I built that into um, a small firm with a, a few employees and we had taken off, uh, the business was growing really quickly. And then I realized uh, in the first year and a half that it's great uh, to have a bunch of clients and um, have a, a growing company, but I, I hated consulting. Really? I hated working for other companies and helping them scale their business because you'd get involved in one silo piece of the business and you couldn't uh, you couldn't venture off to other pieces of yeah, the company. Yeah, can't scale, yeah. I had been fortunate early on in my career, did well in, with the consulting company, um, and uh, some guys that I had known in private equity and, and uh, investment banking were like, hey, let's go out and do a, a sponsored search, which is uh, them basically funding an acquisition, which I would go on and run the company. Um, but I quickly realized that I could just do it on my own with mm-hmm. my own capital. So I went out, uh, searched for a company for about six months until Marissa and I kind of looked at each other and said, hey, we really think that we could do something with your family family's business. And uh, what we wanted to do is Go ahead. And it was really because I would complain all the time to him and be like, <laughs> well, this is what I want to do, but I can't because my parents were unsure or they yeah. didn't want to take the risk, but I was itching to take that risk. Yeah. So after him constantly hearing bits and pieces of what I was experiencing, yeah. that's how he really got interested in it because um, he had really great advice. And although I would pitch what he told me to say to be a little more political and sure, neutral with my yeah. family, it still didn't go anywhere. So I just said to him, I think we could do this. And yeah. he agreed. So in October 2019, we sat my family down and asked them if we would we could buy the company. I don't really remember how the conversation went. Was it like good? Um, like over dinner or something? Or Yeah. 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 But I, I just... Th- I think uh, her... Uh, I don't think her dad thought it was real until we actually like sign the contract like yeah. it, i mean the acquisition took longer than anticipated it took about eight months to close and i think through the entire process he um still didn't think it was actually going to close but here i mean just doing some research i mean you guys are obviously very successful 300 percent growth in the last six months business journal you guys are in seven states in the united states and counting you're in most retail and you know walmart meyer I mean, I go to my local Walmart and I see, hey, Purple Rain, like, oh my gosh, like, that's so yep. cool. Thank you. Last year, you did 70,000 ca- 70, cases. You're on pace to do 100,000 in 2022. Yep. Like, this isn't a small, like, production. Like, this is big time. Thank you. Like, how proud are you? guys have, must be very, very proud of the product and, like, you guys were able to take that risk. Yeah, I mean, I think as evolving entrepreneurs, you're always looking at the next thing and trying to make it bigger and better. So I don't think we're ever really uh, comfortable or ever really can that's huge uh, yeah ever okay with where we're at so you know we yeah. wanted to hit fifty thousand cases we went way north of that we wanted to hit a hundred thousand cases we want to be a quarter million cases and we want to be half a million cases so it doesn't really end um yeah you don't take it for granted like, yeah you could feel the highest of all the highs things are going great everyone's happy and then all of a sudden something comes crashing through so there are moments where we're happy, but it's just like, oh, things are going well. Let's enjoy the moment until yeah. something comes through the door and yeah. we have to deal with it. I mean, that's everyday business, but Absolutely. like Evan said, it's so exciting, but we just know how precious the moment is and how unbelievable mm-hmm. our path is. So we don't take anything lightly. So oh, yeah. although we're doing so well, we just know we have to work even harder to keep it up and of course yeah. grow we, yeah. we always had a good saying back in college when i wrestled at, at baldwin wallace and our, our head coach just always said never let your highs get you too high and never let your lows get you too low right you're that gonna have a good one. you're gonna have amazing points in your life when you feel amazing but you can't you obviously you have to stay very humble and when you're too low and things suck you just gotta you know pick yourself back up so obviously you guys are on the very high and everything and i'm glad to see it Right. So, so talk about, I know you guys were talking about like the expansion and everything and, um, both of you guys, like your backgrounds are in finance, marketing, branding and everything. Talk about the, how you guys are expanding your name with the brand. Like, how are you doing social media? How important is that? Yeah. I mean, I think Marissa can talk about social media piece of it, but regarding like brand development, um, and, uh, and, and state growth and market growth, it's really about getting eyeballs on the product. And, uh, we spend the majority of our capital, 
uh, on the marketing sales and developing strategies and relationships with retailers to get in primary placements on the shelf, uh, to get action eye displays, to get end cap displays, because that's what drives velocity. And that's what drives data to yeah. get the retailers to keep it on the shelf. And, you know, really at the end of the day, uh, retailers don't care as much about the product as they do about the data and the sell through. Really? And so we have a great product yeah. and retailers love us for that. But the only thing that really keeps you on that shelf is the data. And so we focus heavily on data. We focus heavily on sell through. We focus heavily on inventory on hand. And we drive that back into our buyers to ensure that we get primary placements, we get features, and uh, we can continue to grow the brand. And that's the primary uh, goals for the market development that we have. And on the on the B two C piece of it, on the social side of it, Marissa can can yeah. chime in. I mean, for me, although it's great to look at your competition, I try not to at the same time because for sure. I don't always want to be heavily influenced about what the others are doing. Mm-hmm. I like to be myself. I want our story, what we're doing, to reflect in our branding too. So I, I really like to be creative or just show what you could do with the wines in mm. your home, like certain recipes, what it pairs well with, or just showing the behind the scenes of the business. I know uh, part of what we have done with our, our recent investment, we are hiring a full-time video crew to uh, really help me put more of that content out there. Yeah, um, you talk so, to these guys. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited about it. Um, even just feeling more comfortable working with my team too, because they see the vision mm-hmm. um, on doing more fun TikToks and yeah. uh, just really putting ourselves out there. And I think there's strength in that vulnerability because everyone, at least for me at the beginning, I was afraid to put myself out there, but it's almost empowering just to hit send and yeah. just know that you had fun with it. And it's not always about getting a customer. It's about just being yourself and yeah. Staying true to the brand. I mean, you guys, obviously, you guys have a very good product, right? Like I was saying before the podcast, my fiance and I made chicken marsala. We had the sweet rosé and it paired. Oh, um, so great. It paired so well, right? So the product is amazing. You guys are doing amazing with the brand too. Um, But like in terms of the the videography, so what are you doing with that? Like, I know you said you're going to hire more videographers and increase like with TikTok and stuff. But are you doing, like, what else are you encompassing with that? Yeah, so we're going to focus on a lot of our LinkedIn content. I really enjoy my network. I like sharing our story. So uh, more of that firsthand type of um, connection you'll have with me and and the team. So Mm -hmm. just talking about our our growth and what we're doing or some challenges that we've had, just to put a little more personality behind my posts because mostly I post photos and a description on what what I'm trying to share, but I really want to shed light on who we truly are and we are going to accomplish that through video. Um, But besides that, we are going to focus even more on creative point of sale in store. So Mm -hmm. just stuff that really catches your eye and is creative. Maybe you haven't seen other businesses do before, but we're really trying to use those dollars strategically and have fun with them too. Yeah, that capital allocation is huge. Are you going to be in any of the videos or? We'll see. <laughs> I don't think I'm as uh, photogenic as my wife I, over there. I beg to differ. But I think it's, it's you know, for us, it's all about being raw, right? Like um, people care about people. People don't care about brands. So yeah. um, for us, especially being uh, that type of people we are and uh, the, the team that we have, uh, I, I don't want to say that we're like counterculture the wine industry, but like there's so many people are afraid to like get out there and do things differently. And you see, yeah. you see young entrepreneurs getting into the beer space and craft beers hit, hit, hit its prime a while ago. And, you know, there's still new brands coming out and RTDs are taking off, but really not that many people are touching the wine space because it's, it's not as fun. It's not as exciting. Uh, and there's not new things happening in it. But like, if you look at any of our brands, they're bright, they're fun, they're modern, uh, uh, sometimes you say, is it a wine or is it an RTD? Like what exactly what is, is it? What is RTD? I'm sorry. I'm ready to drink cocktail. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, which are, it's a huge market now. Right. Uh, and so without jumping into any of the fads, we, we just want to be a, a, the younger sort of hip 
a bit of counterculture to the wine space yeah. and so being raw and showing people the shit that we're going through to build the brands and the bureaucracy they deal yeah. with in retail um i think that's what builds the brand i think that's what gets other retailers interested in carrying us because we are young and we do have a brand that's doing uh doing well and uh we uh, our story works to the 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 data that the industry is showing which is hey the wine industry is shrinking we need to get people younger than the current consumers into it the millennials the gen z's those are the people we need how do we do it well this is how we do it by developing brands that we're developing and who is your typical consumer like demographic yeah so it really depends on the brand like uh we have a passion line as well which is actually available at dave's markets in cleveland right now we have a blackberry tropical rose and peach right. uh, i would say that demographic is between 25 and 45 mm -hmm. if um but a little bit on up to like 55 60 year, years old as well um but purple rain is mostly like 35 to 55 and then the reds is between like 35 and 55 as well yeah maybe a little bit of a younger demographic so mm -hmm. um but the passion line really speaks to um, the new wine consumer as well. And I was speaking about the passion demographic we had before we rebranded. Um, but although we have kept those customers between you know, that age group, we're now with our new packaging, we're also more um, into the Gen Z millennial sure. demographic as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's like, oh my gosh, I can only think of, I mean, in Cleveland itself, like how many of these microbreweries are up? I feel like, just like you said, how many times do you just see, oh, there's just this new craft brew that's coming up? You know what I mean? It is almost like a, a dying fat almost, but it's, it seems so redundant. The redundancy is, is too much almost. You sure. Know? And you know, when, we, when we're developing brands, I mean, our on-premise sales, like what we do at our winery is, is very small. So our company, we, we call ourselves a wine company, not a winery. And we say that because we are developing products to take mainstream and developing products to go national. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, really great uh, brokers. We have really great vineyard partners that we work with to source high quality grapes. Um, and we're producing fabulous products, but we need to do it at a scale that we can, we can get national with. And so we're, it, it's a, uh, it's a blend of making sure that we're getting that uniqueness that we're looking for, the quality that we're looking for, making it a modern package and then being able to scale it quickly so that we can take it at a multi-state and then eventually a national level. Mm -hmm. And you said when it comes to capital allocation and everything, you guys were talking more so not as much research and development, mostly the sales and marketing, right? Yeah. So how do you guys come up with that? Like when you look at your portfolio and you're saying, all right, hey, this is what we've made. How do you guys, how do you determine, you know, what money goes where? Yeah. At, at first, when we took on the company, we had, uh, we had to get rid of a lot of like the old crap. So like, like, like we, we had like a ton of SKUs, like way more than we needed. We had like 35 or 40 SKUs. We like slashed 85% of them and said, okay, what's doing well for us? What are we making money on? Those are what we need to scale. So we did that with Purple Rain. We did that with Passion. We did that with Reds. That's the reason that they're in the market now. They look the way they do and they're scaling the way they are. Then it was, okay, what do we do next as a runner up to the products that are doing well to keep on developing the SKUs, keep on getting more diversity in the market and capturing a new audience. Uh, we really break down our development into uh, team uh, uh, team decisions. So it's not okay. like our head winemaker saying, hey, this is what we need to do, or we're saying this is what we need to do. Like we have a pretty diverse team and we're saying, hey, what do you guys think? What do you see doing well? We look at industry data, we look at what competitors are doing, and then we develop it out from there. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we relaunched Passion, that was a really old looking label. We yeah. did it, uh, when we rebranded, we branded really modern, really bright, really um, clean label. And it's done really well for us. And so when we develop new flavors, we're saying, you know, how can we go against the grain of what typical uh, wineries are doing? Can we come out with something crazy like a lemon lavender? Can we come out with a blueberry hibiscus or a lemonade? Or 
different things that are attracting the early adopters, meaning like just turning 21 Mm -hmm. to get them as our audience, to get them into the wine space because they can just as easily go and buy a Truly or go and buy (laughs) um, a Smirnoff Ice or Mike's Hard Lemonade or whatever you name it. There's a million fucking products out there, right? But how do we get them in in our category? How do we get them in the wine category? And, And those are things that we're always thinking about. And those are the reasons that our retailers really enjoy working with us. Yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, I'd imagine like for at least my fiance and I, when we, when we drink your guys' products, right, it's, you know, at a nice dinner, like when we cook and it's at a nice dinner, we want to be able to pair that with some, uh, with a good meal. Right. But I wouldn't drink it, you know, at a football game, you know? So I don't know. Are you appealing more to when you're saying you're appealing more to the younger, younger group and what setting do you see them drinking that? Your, your product. Yeah. So like you said, at home or at watching Netflix, having drinks on the patio or, mm-hmm. you know, pretty much at the home or sharing it with one another. Maybe I got invited to a, a dinner party and I'm going to bring one of our, our wines because it's uh, fun. It's engaging. It's not just some chateau on the label that <laughs> doesn't really emulate anything so that's what i see mm-hmm. and just through our customers sharing their experiences with our brands on social media that's what we're seeing as well but we do see some of our customers making uh cocktails of our wines really cool no recipes. way yeah yeah we're putting a little splash of our peach passion and sauteed mushrooms uh really interesting ways to use the wine as well but like evan said we are looking forward to the future and thinking how we could put our wines in more settings like a stadium we are considering doing a spritzer like wine in can um that's a little more mobile than glass so yeah we are looking at that but that is going to take some infrastructural changes and some product development to make sure that when we do do that it's something we're proud of it seems like you guys keep a very uh run a pretty tight ship right so ask our employees i don't know (laughs) Yeah. For the most part. For the most part? Yeah. yeah. yeah Maybe do. not like here. We, 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 you see like TVs everywhere oh and gosh. couches. And I thought I saw popcorn being thrown across <laughs> the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doc. <laughs> we, we do talk a lot about and the other um, entrepreneurs that we've had on as guests on the podcast. And most times I don't even bring it up really, but um, it usually just comes up as a subject, right? So company culture, right, is, is huge. And even... Um, in my business classes, I'm sure you've had it when you went to class, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we always heard how important company culture is, right? So I want to hear, and what, what is, what is your guys' company culture? How would you define it? Yeah. I mean, I think company culture, uh, at large comes from the top down, right? So the C-level executives are the ones that are driving the culture for the rest of the company. Um, we really, I believe run a deconstructed, uh, organization, meaning that we really try to allow our team members to make the best decisions for the company. Uh, we kind of look at it like uh, innovation within uh, the organization or within uh, the core of the organization. So looking at uh, our winemaking team and our production of, uh, of our wines or looking at our bottling line and seeing the efficiencies there, like we really want and drive the open communication to allow each individual team member to be able to come back to us and say, hey, this is how we need to do this better because this is what I'm seeing and this is what I think is going mm-hmm. to make the company better, make it more profitable, make it more efficient, whatever that may be. And uh, prior to us taking over, that wasn't the case. It was one person making all the decisions. And so as opposed to starting a business where you are the culture and you bring on your team, we acquired a business. And so there's a very different uh, aspect sure. of that yeah. coming into an organization that has a pre-existing culture and breaking that. So there were a lot of tense times of getting people to understand the direction that we're taking the company and understanding that you're going to fail once in a while. It's fine, but fail, fail quickly and then correct it and move on. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've instilled all of our team members that we want them to make decisions because we're trying to focus on growth. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we want to focus our time on. But we have a lot of fun too. Yeah. Okay. okay. We're always (laughs) laughing. We're at least next week. I'm really excited. I'm playing a TikTok video with uh, some of the team. So we're getting creative and have fun with that. So stay tuned to my TikTok channel, but, um, We've had pretty much zero turnover as well. Everyone really has a good time. Um, 
I feel everyone works fairly well together Mm -hmm. and it's an environment that people are comfortable um, with each other and coming to us if they need something, which is really important. And are most of your employees younger, older, same age? We we definitely have a younger crew. I mean, um, I guess if you look at, we have... It's pretty diverse, but I'd say the majority are a bit younger. Um, Most under 40, yeah. but between you know, 22 and 60 yeah. is our age range. It's crazy. So like I, we're around all around the same age, right? And at least for me, when I'm trying to be a leader in my in my industry, and there are a lot of parallels between, I mean, you guys are in wine, I'm in mortgages, but there's so many different parallels because it's all business, right? For me, I have sometimes difficulty when it comes to approaching like people who are older right and because i can see something hey they're not doing something right i know i know what is the right thing to do do you ever get into a situation like that not even necessarily with your own employees but like hey you guys are very savvy in your industry how do you approach a situation like that where it's like well i know you're not doing the right thing you know yeah i'm a pretty direct person so i don't really <laughs> hold very much so um, I, to be fair, like, yes, there are situations where we deal with whether it's distributors or whether we deal with our own employees, where there's that difference in opinions or difference in understanding for how our generation does something versus what their gen- generation does. But in particular with our team, like, um, uh, you know, we, we set the, the, the tenor for the organization and we give everyone a very defined vision for what we have and everyone knows that if they're bought in then they're also going to benefit from it too so we have a funny way of um weeding people out they weed themselves out as opposed to us having to weed them out for mm-hmm. them um but with that we get a lot of great uh people that are bought into it and the way we look at it is hey this is the direction of the company this is where we're going it's proven successful uh if you can't work with it then maybe this isn't the right thing for you and or when we have those conversations is we bring you on to do your job Uh, we don't micromanage we expect you to do the job that you're brought on for um and uh therefore they tend to take that ownership and want to want to do Mm -hmm. what's right for the organization so um you know we don't have to deal with it that often um but i will say that when it does i mean we we typically tackle it head on very direct yeah yeah Yeah. he handles that (laughs) i just smile and wave (laughs) (laughs) love it so your leadership styles and do they you would you say they complement each other when it comes to situations like this definitely i have a lot of empathy And Evan does too, but he's super direct. Like, well, maybe if you word it this way, or we just have such opposite personalities, but also jive really well together that it's a good balance. So, so why, so why is Marissa a good leader? And he just explained it. And then we'll, we'll ask the same question. (laughs) Oh, I'm interested in this answer. Uh, I mean, she definitely is a visionary when it comes to the direction of the company and the the way that we promote ourselves. And Marissa really is a spokesperson for the company too. And so um, I think she definitely is not afraid to get out in front of the camera. She's not afraid to speak her mind and she's amazing at public speaking too. So I think her, and, and for both of us probably, but I think for her, um, her her style of leadership more comes from just her own actions of showing people that she's not afraid to get out there, do whatever it takes to to make it work. And everyone knows, you know, Marissa and I aren't at the office every day. I mean, we're traveling, uh, we have calls, we work remotely. It's it, it's all over the place, mm-hmm. and so we know that when we're not there our team is working and they know that when we're not there that we're working and it's very prevalent in in what's getting done and in her uh, ability to really take our story and package it up and be able to sell it is what she's amazing at yeah and for evan um one thing that everyone could notice at the winery he's the first one there and usually last to leave he'll get there huge, yeah. between 5 and 6 a.m and get a lot of work done prior to everyone arriving so he can be available for that additional support if anyone needs that throughout the day um he also is very great at finding efficiencies and understanding how to make everything work so much easier for everybody so that 
in my eyes is really important because no one wants to waste their time. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants those improvements and to feel that we're moving in the right direction and trying to do what's best for the, the group. Um, and he's really talented at that, but also very opinionated and <laughs> Unfortunately, and fortunately, usually he's always right. Yeah, I gotcha. So are you guys all, so I imagine just being like the power couple that you guys are and everything, (laughs) like, do you guys have a certain time where it's, hey, you know, 7 p.m., no business, we're talking about blah, 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 or is it just always on your mind? (laughs) I tell him business is canceled when I had enough because <laughs> yeah. he'll, he's like last night put, pulling up the laptop and showing me all the stuff. I'm like, listen, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah. It's eight <laughs> o'clock. Like I just need a moment. Yeah. So yeah. that's my style. But if I'm focused, even if it's late, I'll handle it. But For sure. usually I'm the one who uh, cans the discussion if I just need a break yeah yeah that's fair i mean it's our life right like it just this shit doesn't end it just all there it, nothing can really surprise you anymore because something's always happening yeah. so mm-hmm. it definitely consumes uh our our life no doubt but yeah usually it's marissa's like hey i've had enough like let's maybe like talk about something else for a little bit yeah i, I think it's sometimes hard to turn off when you're so passionate about something and you really want to be able to make sure hey capital allocations here marketing's here you know what happened here and stuff and you know i i'm the same way Way, right i want to every you know whether it's investment investing or it's you know in, you know mortgage banking or it's podcasting uh i have very a lot of passion for it so i want to make sure everything is going well it's a well-oiled machine but at the same time you do have a life you need to experience that too so i see both sides um we're working on it yeah <laughs> I, but you but it's a young company so obviously there's yeah. gonna be kings right so interested about this though um tell me about how the last two years have been with the, like with COVID, right? COVID-19 and um, what were the challenges there, if any? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take it first. For us, we were definitely uncertain what was gonna happen to the wine industry or just the business overall because we did acquire the business May 2020, which was peak pandemic. Oh my gosh, start. yeah. Uh, but we decided to move forward and just bet on ourselves that we'll figure it out, which we definitely did, but there are a lot of ebbs and flows of uncertainty but one thing for sure was people really enjoyed wine during covid and (laughs) we were um in a position to um, enter a few new markets and we're able to really produce and showcase that we can sell our brands outside of ohio's border Mm -hmm. which really helped set our business case up to expand to the eight states we're in today and by mid-june if not sooner we'll be in uh, 10 states which will be alabama and georgia so um it was almost a time where you worked even harder to make sure that the business thrived and survived and i think it's partially why we're successful today because we had a lot of um moments that we learned from and we're able to fine-tune our strategy Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely is anything affecting you guys now? Like, you know, you hear in the news every day, it's inflation's high, mm. right? Gas prices are high. I'm sure that has an effect on your distributors, right? So is does that supply chain go back to affecting you guys as well? And how, like, how are you combating that? Yeah, I mean, you know, fortunately we have good suppliers that we have contracts with uh, that extend out years. So we tend to know pricing uh, fairly well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we do our absolute best not to have to pass on increased costs to our customers because we have a certain price point that we want to hit for them. Our mission really is um, modern wines for the everyday consumer at an affordable price, and we want to maintain that at, at all costs. So we do uh, everything we can to absorb the costs and alleviate uh, increases when we possibly can. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, bottle prices increased, uh, materials for labels have increased, a lot of things have increased. Oh, it's um, ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, we try to find efficiencies internally, whether it be um, how we're bottling or uh, the, the times of uh, production, whatever it may be to, to make up for those uh, cost increases so we don't have to pass those on to our customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just in my industry, just you look at lumber, right? When houses are being built and you're looking at a house, hey, you know, Mr. Builder, we're going to look at, you know, a $500,000 home. Oh, well, the cost of lumber is up 300%. So it's actually like 750,000 or maybe yep. a million. That's too bad. Yeah, yep. no doubt. So do you see yourself 
going obviously you're east of the mississippi i imagine you guys are going to try and go west expand right so talk about like a five-year plan then like are you going to move west and say you capture that market are you moving international maybe to italy well, the, <laughs> the the majority of the market uh, is on the East Coast. Even if you're a West Coast winery, like the majority of your market is on the East Coast. Sure. So we are really well located in Ohio. Oh, so already. You already, got it. Right. Um, so we, at this point, don't have any plans to go west of the Mississippi. Um, I mean, the primary, I mean, our, our, our primary consumer is a sweet wine customer, right? And so the primary markets of sweet wine are the Midwest and uh, and and southern states. Mm-hmm. So we do really, really well in the southern markets. North Carolina has been great for us. Tennessee has been great for us. We just entered Kentucky. That's doing well for us. And Alabama is going to be a home run for us as well, like all the other southern states. Um, regarding uh, additional expansion, you know, there's so much to our there's so much to do in our existing markets. Like even in Ohio, yeah, in our home market, like we do more volume in certain states outside of Ohio than we do in our home market, just because we have so much to cover still in, mm-hmm. in all the states that we're in. So we really try to focus on uh, sustainable business in our existing markets this year. But because of the success that we've had, uh, we've been able to take our brands into more markets. That's why we're looking at Alabama and Georgia as we as we speak. Um, but once we hit that, really focusing on our existing markets, developing out better practices in those markets, developing out better customer relationships in those markets are key to sustain our business. So yeah. I don't see us going uh, further than the Mississippi, yeah. west of the Mississippi for a while. Uh, we have a lot of work to cover still on the Makes East sense. Coast. Yeah. It almost seems like unpro- like too much cost, too much time then at that point, really. So then it kind of circles back to all right, we'll get the state, and then I'm imagining you go visit, right? Because you you guys visit a lot of like the Myers and Walmarts and oh, everything. Yeah. We typically say that we go on a, a tour of Walmarts, basically. No, we enjoy getting out to market. We love seeing the other products in the market. We love seeing the customers that are buying the products. We love seeing the customers that are our stores that are buying the products. We love seeing our distributors too. And you really don't get a, a grasp of the market of what your your impact is and what you're do what what your distributors are facing in those states unless you actually get out there and do it Mm -hmm. and understand it and each state has such different laws regarding alcohol distribution um, that really you need to understand the markets really well if you want to make an impact in them so uh, it's been a while actually since we've traveled we've been really focused on some stuff back uh, at home office and at the production facility but um, it's going to ramp up here pretty soon because We've yet to visit Kentucky. We've yet to get there soon. And all the other states we haven't visited in a while. So we'll be on a tour here pretty soon. So when you're talking about your customers, like, have you ever just been out and about and you see someone drinking your wine and you're like, oh my gosh, they're like, that's... Like, I see all- people pick up the wine all the time when we're at the store. It's really cool. Yeah. And I'm just like... A you proud get, mom, like, yeah. watching for a distance, not to, like, to you be don't, creepy, but I'm like, oh my well, gosh. You, it's that's exciting. it. You don't want to be too creepy, but like, hey, like... <laughs> why, why are you buying that? Like, why did you pick it up? Or what What makes you interested in it? Like, it, we are so fascinated by consumer insight, not in like the general scope of it, but literally Me like a customer me. in the middle of North Carolina at a Walmart, you're standing by a pallet and someone comes by and picks up two bottles. Like, why did they do that? They've never had the product before. They've never tried it before. Like, what makes them do that? Mm-hmm. So without being too creepy, you kind of go, hey, like, why are you buying that product? Yeah, Is and it sometimes, any good? sometimes yeah. you get an answer. <laughs> it, it better be. Yeah, sometimes you get an answer. Do you ever pinch yourself, with, like with the amount of success you're going, or do you just try not to no. think about that? No. I just want to survive another day, honestly. Yeah, there's always a there's a, usually a tragedy once a week, so uh, yeah, it humbles yourself. Yeah. I mean, especially there's you know there's a lot of brands, especially in the RTD space, that are that are being built uh, that are brands, right? They're not they're not the manufacturing company behind it. It's so like not only are we the brand, we have like a brand division, like our sales division of what everyone sees, but like there's a there's a manufacturing plant behind this and a winery that's producing all these products, and so we deal with the supply chain we deal with glass prices we deal with uh crop we deal with uh fermentation tank explosions, tank yeah. explosions. i mean you f- name it like we're yeah. dealing with it on top of trying to sell the products so with that comes 
something all the time so yeah. it, it keeps us humble don't don't worry yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it like survive another day just another day without a tragedy everyone's happy let's let's yeah. have a good weekend that's yeah. that's my attitude every day yeah so. but, but also doing things i uh, differently in the market like most uh most wine brands like they don't blow up overnight like you don't typically see that right so you go into a market and you get uh target or walmart or um uh you know name another circle uh, k K, whatever it is they say you know Mm -hmm. what i'm gonna bring you into 10 stores to see how you do and we'll go from there you sign with the distributor they take it to the shelf it's sitting on the shelf it slowly gets sold through and then maybe you get a display here you get a feature there we like to do the complete opposite. Like we go in without any shelf space typically, which is really kind of ballsy. Uh, and we say, hey, like let's get some features, let's get some data. So like we have relationships with our retail partners, with market managers that control multiple stores. Uh, we're working with them to develop out campaigns to push product hard in a market, get the launch, and then go from there. So like it's it's different, it's unique, and uh, it's going against the grain a bit. So we it's have to gritty teach for sure teach our distributors like how to work with us and how to how to execute with us to make sure that we get the data to get down to the shelf and so on and so forth so it's it's, it's, it's learning but like i think tornado. Mm-hmm. definitely but i think so for me like marissa has been in the industry for a while now so she kind of understands understands how it goes but me not coming from the industry we can look at things and say oh let's do it this way and people are like oh well you, you, that's not how it works like well why not like let's yeah. try and see if it works and yeah. sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't yeah that makes sense. I mean, a lot of like one guy that we had on, an entrepreneur, uh, John, uh, John DeJulius. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm familiar. Oh, gotcha. So his, so for his salons, right, he talks a lot about how it's not like a typical salon where, you know, you, you, you go in, you sit down, you wait for somebody to come to you, right? As soon as you go in, you're treated like like that like Disneyland you're like treated like royalty right and it's different like someone comes up with an iPad to you asks you how your day was and they put you right in and it's more of like an experience right that he has so is John Roberts in his for his salons and everything but what he loves doing is he loves looking outside of his industry to see what other people are doing outside oh, yeah. and say like oh my gosh like hey, you know, these people are doing this. I wonder if that could work for, for us. And he'll implement it. Maybe it fails. Who cares? Yeah. Um, and then he'll like look at a different industry and see like, oh, they're doing this. All right, let's try and take that and see if that works here. Yep. And maybe it does, maybe that one sticks. But like, it sounds kind of like the same thing where, hey, you know, this is what our competitors are doing in the wine industry and they've been doing this. Let's do something different. Yeah, right. no doubt. I mean, we're always looking at other other industries, other consumer packaged products outside of our industry and thinking about, well, how are they doing it that way? Or why are they doing it that way? Um, and you know, we have really great uh, people around us too. You know, so Welch's is a really strong partner of ours. We work with them a lot. Um, uh, I'm not sure if they want me using their name or not, but screw it. I'm sure they'll be fine with it. Sure. Um, uh, they are really great supporters of us and, and they help us navigate some of the markets that are, we're new to, right? They're a national brand. They uh, know what they're doing. Um, we're really good at market growth, but we need to get better at market sustainability. So in that realm of things, like looking at other industries and what they're doing, looking at other companies and what they're doing, but then having a sounding board to saying, mm-hmm. hey, uh, a billion dollar company like Welch's, uh, you know, tell us what we're missing. Tell us how we get better sustainability. Tell us how we work better with these consumers. Tell us how this we can utilize this data to do better. Mm-hmm. So adding in all those pieces and then applying it to our business to allow us to scale quickly, but then have it be sustainable yeah. has been really the, the measure of our success so far. Yeah. And I love what you're doing with TikTok too, right? Is you know, a lot of that, uh, the customer that you're trying to attract and everything, there are a lot of them are on TikTok, right? And, you know, seven second, 30 second clips. I mean, you've been doing really well with it. Do you have certain goals too, then to try and hit there? Or is it just like, ah, we'll just. I just want to create content that I like and mm-hmm. it's fun. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's great if we go viral, but I don't have like this goal to be having a million followers or something. Just. I'm just trying to have fun at this point on the app because I feel like those who take it too seriously, just like, you can just tell. Yeah. So you're not really like regimented because I know obviously like like you were saying, we're, you're doing a lot of different things every day. Um, are you regimented then with the social media, with that kind of branding or is it just like, oh, we'll do something right now? I only create something if I have a really great idea or yeah. it just makes sense for me in the moment. Um, so I might produce 
30 videos in a month or it might be one a month. It just depends on what's going on. I might have meetings and all kinds of planning to do for our distribution companies. It's not always working with my schedule. So it's more of a ebb and flow thing, but it's great to now have a um, some support with a video team to mm -hmm. help me produce content when I'm strapped for time. Are they going to be traveling with you when you guys go to Kentucky? The Probably more? not that far. I They'll... think our retailers will be like, who are these people? Like yeah. 30 this is people a, walking like in MTV. the door? Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll definitely do some traveling with them, but probably not as far as out of state, at least not this yet. vlog, I can bring a camera with me and they can edit it. Let's just talk about this then. So just general business advice, right? Because like I was saying before the podcast, a lot of people who are watching this are entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, salespeople, investors, people who are really wanting to start businesses. So what would you, like both of you, what would you say like just in general, just business advice if you're trying to look to start up your own business? If you don't believe in yourself, don't start. I mean, yeah. you have to be relentless in overcoming a lot of struggle, a lot of challenges. You need to know that no matter what is gonna happen, you have to keep going because that's what it takes to grow and start a company. You can't just hit one wall and not climb over it. You have to just figure out the solution to move forward every day, no matter what. And that's what it takes. Yeah, I just think it's a fucking hustle, man. Hey, like, yeah. You just like, especially in today's age with uh, the gig economy and, and people being able to start up a business in two seconds, like it's, you know, it's great to differentiate yourself, but there's so many ways to be entrepreneurial, to do, to start a small company and build into something uh, in your kitchen overnight, right? So that just like grit hustle is like so critical. I mean, you know, Marissa and I did it for so long uh, and I say so long, like I shouldn't say that because, you know, fortunately for us, like we, we crushed it early on in our career. Like it took me a couple of years to really get under my feet and, and be able to build a successful business um, until I was able to then finance my own acquisition. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to do that, but it's all because of the hustle over those early years and just figuring out what works, what doesn't work, failing quickly and moving on and doing something differently. Like... Um, just being persistent, right? So I think uh, on top of everything else, like consistency and being persistent is probably the the biggest key for a lot of companies. And I, I think a lot of businesses don't fail because they had bad ideas. Um, it's because they either just didn't get the execution or because they weren't persistent enough to figure out it out until it worked mm -hmm. and that's i think is what's most critical mm -hmm. or they just stop they get comfortable at a certain level and i love what you guys said early on too like hey we're at our very we're at our highs but that doesn't mean slow down that means keep going keep pushing it's it means harder. push harder yeah right and i think a lot of those you're you're eventually going to get it to a point where hey you have the competitors where they're at the top and now they're just kind of coasting right i mean you see this with companies countries governments where everything is people just kind of get comfortable right yeah i'll never be comfortable yeah i don't think yeah I maybe mean, unless we sell the company one day and i have zero ties to it but um i care a lot about every aspect of the business i feel it's personal although it shouldn't be but i really care for our customers i want them to have positive experiences and enjoy the products and i think about all those small details that it really add up mm -hmm. and I think that's a huge differentiation factor for us but it also is endless 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 and it's hard to shut off so mm -hmm. sometimes at eight or nine o'clock yeah. I'm like I just can't <laughs> yeah can't do it but, but having like a good sounding board is really critical and like I uh, believe that I'm able to do the things I am now because I've had a really great team around me and a really great board of advisors even before I bought a company or started a company just people that believed in me that had done uh, different things in their career had their own successes uh, created their own wealth and believed in what I was building and were able to correct me along the way mm -hmm. and give advice along the way and we have that today now we have a great board of directors we have a great board of advisors and um, when we look at raising capital like we we had before it's not about the dollars like we it, it's not about the money at all you can get money anywhere it's really mm -hmm. about the people involved and so we decide if we want to raise money or, or we don't want to raise money it's not a factor of if we if we have to get the capital 
capital to continue scaling in the rate that we are. It's a matter of who do we need to add to our board to be able to help us develop our concept and continue to scale well with the right sounding board. And that's where we go and look for the right dollars for us to not just get the money, but also get the advice and, and the board to mm-hmm. uh, to continue growing the, and the I was, company. And I was interested in that too. And speak as much or as little as you want about it. But I, I just, I guess I don't, I'm not well versed enough to really understand it to a certain degree, but talk about, so invest Bev, right? Yeah. So that is a like, an investor then that you're trying that you that is signed on with you guys right yes yeah, so they're a private equity company right so they have um uh well they're based out of chicago uh brian rosen and giuseppe are are the principals there brian is a really well-known adult bev expert it's been in the industry for a long long time um really renowned in in the in the market and so when we were looking at do we raise do we not raise do we want to um, we had been connected to Brian through mutual connection and we just hit it off and, uh, his expertise was great. It fit exactly what our, we were looking for. He fit what we fit, what he was looking for. Um, and, uh, they're, a, a great, a great team and, um, the capital allows us to scale quicker than we already sure. anticipated. So looking at raising dollars, it's all about, okay, well, um, if we, if we, uh, want the money? Do we want the money because we need it? Do we want the money because we want to grow faster? And it's always uh, as as long as the answer is we we want it or we need it because of this is a specific purpose. This is what we're going to get out of it. This is how much quicker we're going to be able to grow. That's what it's about. So as you can imagine, it's really expensive to grow in uh, in new markets, mm-hmm. marketing, salespeople trade dollars, whatever it is, you name it. And uh, it's always a question of an order magnitude of how quickly we can grow. Mm -hmm. So can we grow into four more states or can we get better sustainability in our current states by allocating more dollars to it? And because of that, can we grow a company quicker? Can we build a more sound business quicker? And when the answer is yes, that's when we take on the dollars. So, so you are you you guys are constantly seeking these investors, or only when you when a certain project comes about, like oh, we want to expand, let's go look for investors, or you just go back to you. It's it's uh, we're never actually looking for capital. Oh, it, it's only when the right people come you got along. It. That it just happened, honestly. We, yeah, yeah it, it's, people seek you guys out. It's almost. only when the right people come along where we say, "Wow, you know what? They really could help us grow our business. They really, this individual really could give us insight into growing the organization." And that's when we say, "Hey, the the money is great. It's like the cherry on top, but the real value are the people that are giving us the dollars and the advice yeah. that they have to give us." Yeah. So let's just say in a perfect world, right? everything's going great like five, 10 years from now, you guys are a multi-million, billion dollar company. Would you guys ever consider doing like stock options, like an IPO or are you guys gonna stay pretty private? Uh, or is that ever. even like in your Man, thought? that's an Evan question. I'm just... Yeah, I mean, never say never, but I don't see us going uh, public. I mean, Duckhorn did, right? How did that go? Um, I don't follow their okay. stock price, so I couldn't tell you. But uh, I mean, we've seen it in our industry sure yeah. um i don't think it's super common uh but at this point we have not anticipated ever going public i, would say I mean we're 99 percent so, chance <laughs> we're, no. we're, we're pretty yeah. early on we're pretty early <laughs> on still but uh i don't know that uh, the public route is something that we would consider i just want to keep going one day yeah. after the other gotcha so. yeah i'd be the first one to buy some stock just okay well thanks <laughs> chris <Yeah. laughs> So, uh, business aside, so talk about like some relationship advice then, because obviously you guys are doing everything at such a high level. I'm sure that you guys have some, you know, good advice you could give to other people, right? Not don't, even, not even just in business, but just in life, right? Yeah, don't settle. Well, <laughs> oh I mean, wait a minute, hey. <laughs> hey we're married, I, so. I <laughs> whatever anyway relationship wise with the networking for me always do the right thing if it's not mutual mutually beneficial or it's not just to help the other person don't force things like for me i go with the flow if it's the right relationship right chemistry make sure you're always doing the right thing by that person no matter what because your integrity is everything and Mm. that's so important to me i i I think 
directly though like we know our boundaries like we do very different things with the company and uh, i think we made that clear from the start it, it wasn't like we ever had to sit down and say hey like i'm doing this and you're doing this and don't step on my toes and i would step on your toes it was just like it's pretty organic and i think that's really what uh, you need expect i mean obviously she's my wife but also my business partner so uh, we obviously have to trust each other uh, fundamentally, but uh, we also have to trust each other's judgment when it comes to financial decisions and every aspect of it, big and small. And so whether it's a, a, a life partner mm -hmm. or whether it's a, a business partner, like I, I just think it's so critical. And my entire life, I've been very critical of the people that I want around me because you are a product of your environment. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that from your friends and your family and your board, uh, and your business partners and your employees, like all that like develops you as a person and creates the culture that you create for the organization and is what you present as well as your own being and, and your, your relationship. So, uh, you know, as far as like Marissa and I go, like we know how to balance each other well, we know when to push and when to pull back and uh, that's worked really well for us so far. Love it. And we pretty much don't talk the whole day either, except maybe a couple times here and there. I work from home mostly or I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of nice too because at the end of the day, we actually sincerely are able to say, hey, how was your day? Like, <laughs> yeah. What happened? Anything yeah. I need to know? So it's not like we're at each other's throats. It's a, it's a really good balance. And at least from my perspective, what I am doing in my role is really everything I'm really passionate about. And what Evan does at the business, I am not passionate about. So it's great. He has his moment. I have my moment, but we support each other. Well, hey, as we start to wrap up the podcast again, thank you guys for being on. Um, but just want to know, like, plug your product really quick for anybody watching. You know, why should they why should they buy your product and where do they find it? Sure. So um, we have three brands at Luvabella. We have our passion line, which is a fruit-based wine of peach or blackberry or tropical rosé. Right now we also have an apple pie, but we also have our reds line, which is made by me. It's a sweet rosé as well as a California blend of Malbec and Zinfandel, which is a really fun red blend for the everyday uh, type of um, consumption for for food or just with Netflix. But yeah, yeah. we also have our Purple Rain line, which is sweet, crisp, and refreshing and a lot of fun. But we also have a brand new Purple Rain Sangria that is really fruit forward and really great wine for summer. Mm -hmm. You can pretty much find our wines in most major retailers in Ohio, West Virginia, Tennessee, North Co North Carolina. We're in Weiss Markets and Sheets in Pennsylvania, as well as all the way down to... Um, Alabama and Georgia here soon. I think I skipped a few states as I was trying to remember them all in order. <laughs> yeah, Virginia and okay. DC. Tennessee. I think I mentioned Tennessee. Kentucky. But yeah, 10 states. But you could find all our states on our website, which is www.luvabella.com. Cool. We'll put that in the description yeah. too. <laughs> cool. All righty, guys. Hey, that was at CB. Does it 19 or was it 20? 20. Ooh. I think 20. 20. That's, That's a good. Awesome. All right, guys. Hey, that was episode 20 of the Elevate Cleveland podcast. Uh, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah.